Thank you very much for that kind reception. I have to admit, uh, this is a daunting task to try to describe Buddhism in like 30 minutes or less. But you know, we're, we're going to do what we can. And, and, it, and I'll be upfront with you. It's been my prayer for tonight that there will be some here that maybe from our talk, you have Buddhist colleagues, Buddhist friends, that somehow something will connect. And you say, oh, I understand more. I, I know how to relate more. And it's also my prayer that maybe the Lord will work something in someone's heart here. That uh, the Buddhist world will be where you're called to. Maybe to pray or maybe to go. It is a world of 500 million believers in Buddhism. K kind of neglected in our conversations. But I want you to uh, take a journey with me into the Buddhist world. Uh, as I'm starting in our talks, and you know, there'll be some slides up here, um, follow along. You have handouts. Um, we're going to be going through this quickly. Your pens may have flames creeping up behind them, but that's okay. But we're going to do this because I think these will be tools in your hands as you meet friends to kind of get an idea of their worldview. How do the Buddhists see the, the world? And that's what we're going to be talking about. And I want to start, before we get into some of the nuts and bolts here, I do want to express my gratitude to um, uh, Pastor Rod and, I was, and, and, and Pastor Randy for their kindness to me. And uh, some of the slides here, I need to mention a, former, uh, a student of mine, Phil Zarns, who actually put together the nice graphics. If I had to do graphics, they would look more like stick figures. So it is really God's grace that you have those. But let's start with a little bit of a Buddhist background. Where did it start from? Buddhism uh, had its start in, in Hinduism. And in particular, in uh, the borders of Nepal, um, and it dates... Back about 1500, uh, excuse me, yeah, 1500 to 500 BC. So um, the roots go back way far, and some of the conversations going on. I don't have time to go into Hinduism. I believe you've already talked about that. But the Buddhists actually come out of Hinduism. In fact, for many centuries, Buddhist and Hindu was considered uh, Buddhism was considered a branch of Hinduism. And if you, any of you have ever been to Bali, Indonesia, you'll see there's actually uh, some, some um, uh, temples there that have both Buddhist and Hindu stuff together. And it dates from that time period. Um, there was a series of uh, written wisdoms called the Vedas that was the foundation for Buddhism. Collections of songs, poetries, and the like. But the real start of Buddhism starts with who we typically call the Buddha, who is um, Siddhartha Gautama. His dates are roughly 563 to 483. Um, he was actually a prince that lived in northeastern India. He was familiar with the caste system in Hinduism. And the story is, and, and I'm trying to tell you his story because this is what all Buddhas or I shouldn't say all, but most Buddhists will hear, and it informs how they see Buddhism. While he was on a chariot, remember he's a prince, he's riding along, and what does he see? He has visions uh, sent by the gods of people suffering. And what is the suffering? Old age, disease, and death. So, so he is overwhelmed by these, and this informs his journey as we go forward, he sat under a tree by a road. A man in a yellow robe comes up to him and starts describing to him uh, what was going on with the old age, disease, and death. And taught, teaches them how to receive, now notice this, serenity or peace of the soul. He leaves his wife and child to take on asceticism. Now, what is asceticism? Asceticism is you act in such a way that you fast all the time and you um, subjugate the body, may even beat yourself 
to kind of bring the body into submission. And this is what he does for six years. In fact, the story is he became so severely emancipated, they actually could count his ribs in the back through his stomach. That he was that um, malnourished. But he sees it, he's in the midst of this, if he sees it as it fails him. He doesn't reach the peace in his soul. Okay? He cuts to a river, collapses. He wakes up, and there was five other ascetics with him. They were sharing this journey together. And what he ends up doing is he goes, this is not working, so it starts eating. And they all get upset at him. So now he's on his own. From there, he sits under a Bodhi tree, which is kind of a fig tree. And many of you have probably seen a picture. And while he is there, in his thinking about uh, his actions, his desires, he learns the Four Noble Truths, and he reaches enlightenment. And you've seen probably pictures He's under the tree and all the branches blossom with lotus flowers. If you've ever seen that, that's what this moment is about. What does he learn? The goal is rid yourself of all desires in this world. Desire only dharma, which means the ultimate reality, what is real. And the goal is forever to move into nirvana. And to break samsara, which is the rebirth cycle. We're going to come back to what these all mean. But I'm trying to give you an overview from his life. At this point, he achieved enlightenment and became the Buddha, which means the enlightened one. So that's where the name comes from. So this is... The founding of what we call Buddhism. He starts to teach this particular worldview, and this becomes predominant primarily initially in India, but then moves throughout Southeast Asia into China, Japan, and so forth. And we'll talk about some of these things here uh, um, very quickly here. What are some of the basic concepts? I'm, I'm going to survey things. Then I want to get back to how do we relate as believers uh, to Buddhists. One, Dharma. Dharma just means ultimate reality, but in a Buddhist concept. What is ultimate reality? Ultimate reality is that which is beyond suffering, and we'll come to that here shortly. Suffering is an illusion. So besides Dharma... There's also Trishna, which is desire. This is the things that we desire, and what happens with those desires, it leads us astray. And it can be any desire. Dukkha. Dukkha refers to suffering. Remember, uh, Sadat. The Gautama saw these visions of suffering, saw um, disease and so forth. And so he's trying to find an answer for why is there suffering. Now, how does the Buddha do it? I've already mentioned this. They believe suffering is an illusion. There's no real suffering. If you see suffering, it's because you are not seeing the ultimate reality. It's a different worldview. Karma. We need to talk a little bit about karma. We kind of find it as actions and consequences. But in Buddhism, what you do good is on the positive side of your scales. What you do bad is on the negative side of your scales. You hope during the course of your life, your good outweighs the bad. If you are on the bad side, when you get reincarnated, you'll be at a lesser form. If you are good, you may be reincarnated in a better form, and so forth. The goal is to get to the point that you no longer are reincarnated because you're now in nirvana. And that leads to samsara. Samsara is that birth and rebirth process, moving from one life to the next. 
one reality to the next. And then ultimately, the goal is nirvana. Now, I put nirvana here because there's a lot of people in America that's talked about nirvana and kind of use it like heaven. Nirvana is not heaven. For the Buddhist, nirvana is the place you lose complete self and lose yourself in complete serenity. You and I, in the Buddhist worldview, you and I do not exist in nirvana. We lose self. We lose desire. So the whole idea ultimately is to be completely lost in the whole, the ultimate reality. I'm, I'm trying to go through these because I realize it's a different worldview shift. They're different definitions. They mean different things. But to, in order to converse, I think it's important that we talk to them with their language and understand what they're saying when they are talking about these things. So when a Buddhist is talking about heaven, you need to define what heaven means because their definition will be nirvana. And it's not the same. Okay? Now there are four, uh, excuse me, three basic components, belief components. We're going to run through these. The four noble truths. Remember I told you, according to the story about uh, Siddhartha Gautama, these are the four truths he learned through enlightenment under the tree, the middle way, and then the eightfold path. And this eightfold path, every Buddhist is supposed to go through to break the cycle of samsara and, and reach nirvana. The four, four uh, noble truths. Number one, life contains suffering, dukkha. Okay? Fin finish these four with me and then you'll understand <laughs> Number two, suffering comes from desire. The reason you have suffering in this world is because desire has shifted our perspective. Number three, when our attachment to desire ends, so does suffering. In other words, the way to get rid of suffering is to get rid of desire. And interestingly, their definitions here is what I was trying to tell you. Suffering ultimately is not real. It's an illusion. So you have to get rid of desire in order to get to the ultimate real. And then number four, the fourth noble truth. The path to end suffering is to follow the eightfold path. Now, I'm going to come into these in a few moments here. Notice for the Buddhist. Buddhism is fundamentally about a way of life. How do you live? How do you live in your day-to-day -day activities? How do you live your actions? The way of the, the, the Buddhist worldview, the way of the middle, is to always re remember Buddha. He was ascetic for a while and realized that wasn't the answer. So what did he do? Do the mediating path. Don't go to self-indulgence and also don't go to um, self-mortification, getting rid, you know, uh, subjugating yourself. Eat appropriately. Work appropriately. The whole thing is meant to be right in the middle, a life of moderation. The next is the eightfold path. This is how to remove desire. Remember, desire is an enemy, if you will. Number one, right understanding, which is seeing the world as it really is, not how we choose to see it. Number two, right intent. Sorry, like I said, there's flames creeping up behind some pens. I'm seeing that here. Right intent. To decide to commit to Buddha's middle path rather than desire of the world. And remember, the, the desires for Buddhism can be the full range. We can talk about desires for food. We can talk about um, um, desires for money or ill-gotten gains. Any form of desire is considered uh, wrong. 
Number three, right speech. A recognition of truth, no gossip, no harsh words, being compassionate in your talk. Now, let me just put a little caveat here. Uh, when they say uh, uh, truth and, and no lying and things like this, their definitions and the traditional American definitions are not identical. Uh, so, so not lying is um, you don't say something that is detrimental but also harmful to people. So a high value in many cases of being a bit more diplomatic, shall we say, uh, and things like that. But it's not identical to how we, I just wanted to highlight that. Right action, number four. Live ethically. Do not steal. Do not kill. Do not lie. Do not be intoxicated. No sexual misconduct. This is considered part of that, eight, that eightfold path. Number five. Right livelihood. Work well if one is able. Do not engage in slavery, weaponry, harm in another living being. Uh, interestingly, th devout, many but devout Buddhists are also very much against uh, the trafficking industry. But many, because of karma, accept it. And that's a different conversation, and we can talk about that later. Next, uh, number six, right effort, enthusiasm, steadiness, determination, positive thinking, that we, we have good attitudes, if you will, in our day-to-day -day life. Number seven, right mindfulness, to be clear and undistracted, aware of past actions and of future interactions. And then number eight, right consider concentration, excuse me. Focus attention in a worthy direction. And this is the basis of meditation. This is why for the Buddhist, meditation is part of the eightfold path. And it's why we can with, uh, help free ourselves of desire and help reach nirvana through meditation. Now there's three basic uh, molds called the three jewels of Buddhism. It, there's a Buddhist oath. Now, how many of you knew about this? There's a Buddhist oath that to become a Buddhist, you're supposed to say, um, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, and I take refuge in the Sangha. Now, we've already talked about the Buddha, meaning you follow the teachings of the Buddha. You, we've already talked about the Dharma, the ultimate reality. The Sangha um, is actually the community of the Buddha, the Buddhists, the monks, and the nuns. So the three jewels are, number one, the Buddha himself, the enlightened one. And, and in a lot of the Buddhist literature, they'll just call him the Lord. The second one is the Dharma, which is the ultimate reality, the truth based on Buddhist teaching, and then ultimately uh, the Sangha, which is the community. This is how they base, how they learn and develop. Uh, the next I want to show you is how do Buddhists consider ethical living? This should be interesting to you because this is considered key ethical guidelines for the Buddhists. Number one, do not kill living things. Why? Consider this, since you're reincarnated, you don't know if that may be an ancestor or a descendant. Okay? Uh, so, so, if this is, you know, you don't want to be stepping on Uncle Harry or something, you know. But if you'll ever watch Buddhist monks, you'll notice at the end of the day, they will actually pray a prayer of forgiveness for the bottom of their shoes for accidentally stepping on insects. Because there's... Uh, do not kill living things. Let me just make a side comment here. What's interesting, though, for many Buddhists, especially Tibetan Buddhists, they realize in the cold climate, you have to eat meat, but it's a sin to kill. So what they do is they hire a bunch of Muslim butchers for let them kill it, and then it's okay to eat it. You know, it's not a sin to eat. It's just a sin to kill. Anyways, 
Uh, <laughs> a second one. Take only what has been given. So in other words, don't steal. If someone gives you it, receive it. But don't steal. Don't allow, uh, steal. Number three. Do not misuse the sense of indulgence. Be satisfied with simple things. We may call it something like be content. Number four, do not lie. And number five, do not become intoxicated. Now, real quick, I want to go through. In Buddhism, there's actually three major branches of Buddhism. Number one, Theravadin. Theravadin is also called the school of the elders. It is where we have, uh, you'll see the regions here, Sri Lanka, Burma, or Myanmar. We call it Myanmar now, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. You remember pictures of monks that are in like orange or saffron kind of monks? In those, that particular branch of Buddhism, the monk or the nun is what's key for the religion. So if you want to get karma, good karma, you give offerings to the monk. It, to offset maybe some bad things you did. So it's all centered on uh, these monks. And in Thailand, for instance, every schoolboy is supposed to spend a period of time uh, as a novice in a monastery. So it's pervasive. In fact, the Thai flag, if you've ever seen the Thai flag, red, white, blue, white, red, maybe. Um, they didn't go to the World Cup, but you know. The blue was, means Buddhism in the Thai flag. So it's so central to their belief system. The second branch is called Mahayana. Mahayana means the great vehicle. Now Mahayana Buddhism believes that between Buddha and us, there's um, Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva. Excuse me. My tongue sometimes has shown. And those are enlightened ones that stay in our world to help us attain, um, attain enlightenment. So they see it as like heads of their monasteries could be one or a certain level of spiritual beings that come down to help usher into Buddhism. And, and uh, notice the one other thing about Mahayana. Mahayana also is open to families. So families participate as a family. So it's no longer the monk base, it's family based. And then let me add as well um, that each has modifications. Chinese Buddhism will include Taoism and Confucianism. Japanese Buddhism will include Shinto. Korean Buddhism will include shamanism. So even though they all call themselves Buddhists, there's slight differences uh, so as you have friends that are Korean, their form of Buddhism is going to look a bit different than the Chinese Buddhist because of some of those combinations. The third branch of Buddhism is um, Vajrayana, which is also called Tibetan Buddhism, and it literally means the lightning. Now, for those that work with Tibetan Buddhism, um, they are very hierarchical and very tight to the monks, but more than that, um, they are very, very uh, big into spiritual things, demonics and so forth. Um, and, and one of the things they've been known for is everything's tied to the lamas. The most famous, the Dalai Lama, is the head of the Tibetan uh, Buddhist. The number two is called the Panchen Lama. These two are considered reincarnations of Dalai Lamas for many generations. So the reincarnation of leadership is how these function. And we got a, a couple more slides here, and I'm just going to move on. But you can see uh, the map of where Buddhism is. That's the history. Here's a map where predominantly Buddhism is. The yellow parts, the Mahayana branch. Uh, down in the south is a red, that's the uh, um, Theravadan branch. And then Tibet in 
in Mongolia, and one of the sad things in history is when the Khan asked for representatives of the world religions to come to his courts, and the Christians only sent two monks, and the Tibetans sent hundreds. The Mong Mongolia today is Tibetan Buddhist. Um, Buddhism also doesn't have sacred texts the way we do. We have the Holy Bible. For the Buddhists, it's, there is some original works. That's the Dhammapadas. You'll see it there, the sayings of Buddha. There is there kind of the three baskets, the Tripitaka, or the, what's called the Pali Canon. And that's only for the Theravadan. But for other branches of Buddhism, it depends which branch you're talking to. They actually have close to like 66 vi totally different books that are just different uh, religious texts. So the reason I'm telling you this is if you're talking to a Buddhist, depending on which branch they are is what they hold sacred. So like, for instance, the Mahayana Sutras has the Lotus Sutra or the Heart Sutra, or if you're part of what's Chan or called Zen Buddhism, there is no sutras. <laughs> so they don't have an understanding. So my point is this. If you try to bring a biblical text to them, you have to be aware. They may not even understand what sacred text means. Because they don't have in their own religion what a Bible is. So sometimes in those conversations, we have to help answer those questions for them. And then for Tibetan Buddhism, you've heard of the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Tibetan Book of the Dead, they have to read like uh, daily. In fact, there is one of the Tibetan bo books that they actually have to draw daily and then wash it off at the end of the night. So just a few slides on Chinese Buddhism, then we'll get right into how do we connect with them. Chinese Buddhism. I'm using this just as an example. Different sub-branches. Amitabha is called Pure Land Buddhism. And Amitabha Buddhism, uh, this is actually Chan Buddhism. Uh, but Amitabha Buddhism is um, you have faith in the Lord of heaven. And he brings you to nirvana. Chan Buddhism and you may be familiar with it as Zen Buddhism. That's the Japanese word. The way you get to nirvana is pure meditation. And you have to overcome rational thought. The esoteric sect is highlighting uh, certain rituals. And then the Tiantai is called the rational sect. And some of you may be thrilled about this. That's the sect that likes to study. I'm assuming some of you like to study. Maybe not. But what are some of the things? I'm, I'm just using this as an example. Some of the things are, uh, you can see from some of the slides, the Amitabha. I showed you uh, on the left, that's Amitabha. On the right is esoteric sect. Actually, if you go to the temples, they're totally different. You can tell them by what their architecture, which branch they are. They're that different. Next slide, please. I list this is because for many of you, you actually meet Chinese Buddhists, but they have ancestor altars. They'll call it part of their Buddhism. But from what we talked about with Buddha, it doesn't relate there. They have just pulled it together, and it's now part of their belief system. Also, the next slide, traditional Chinese religions actually are polytheist. Buddha, in the teachings of Buddha, is very non-worried uh, about the gods or deities. But Chinese have incorporated it. So now, how many of you have gone to a Chinese restaurant and you may see the one on the left, the three gods? Or sometimes you'll see the one on the right, Guanyin, who's a very famous goddess in Chinese culture. And they, but they'll call themselves Buddhists. All right. Okay, that was, I know, fierce and fast and we ran like the wind... But I want us to get to, okay, you have friends that are Buddhist, you have colleagues that are Buddhist. How do we engage them? This is their belief system. They don't think the, how we do. They don't have presuppositions like we do. How do we engage? 
some of the key things to keep in mind. Number one, be careful about your terminology. If you're talking to a Buddhist, asking them if they've been born again means something very different. <laughs> because they're thinking reincarnation. Adjust our vocabulary to help them understand what our message is really all about. Number two, understand basics, and I'm going to say it this way, about their questions and their worldview. Do some research, do some study, and I'm going to talk about this more later. Listen to what they're saying. Listen to what they believe, because then it'll help you understand more where they're coming from. One, nirvana is not heaven. It's a place of peace because there's no self. There's no people. Our view of heaven is that opportunity to worship the Lord, but each of us having friends and colleagues and knowing Jesus and be able to talk. In Nirvana, none of that takes place. Also, notice karma is the exact opposite of grace. It is not a balancing scale that we do more good than bad, then we'll reincarnate in a better way. Grace is about, you know what? In this life, we're on the negative side on this thing. But God, in his grace, has opened it up to us. Undeserved. Undeserved. So, so having that as an awareness that that is very different. Remember, I've re mentioned repeatedly also for the Buddhist, suffering is an illusion. See, I would say it different for Christianity. Suffering is not an illusion. There's real suffering. But how did God deal with the suffering? Jesus took it upon himself on the cross. And the day will come well, there'll be no more tears, pain. In Buddhism, the goal is the loss of the desire and the loss of self. And what Christian, I would say Christianity says is, you know, the loss of desire is not necessarily a bad thing, but the desire to lose desire itself is a desire. I actually met a Buddhist monk, and it was that question that led him to start to explore. Because ultimately it has to be Christ-centered and God-centered. So how do we relate? Next slide, please. Number one, you need to know, for the average Buddhist, now I'm not talking about an American Buddhist that was born and raised in I don't know, Detroit or something. Uh, but I'm talking about the average Buddha, especially from Asia. Number one, truth is relational. Until you are close enough with them that they know they can trust you, you're trustworthy, they don't have to listen to what you say. It takes a relationship close enough that they say, you know what? I have been with them in life. I've seen they're a trustworthy person. So now when they talk about religious things, I can trust them there too. Truth is relational. But you know what? Relationships take time. To reach your, reach your Buddhist colleague and friend, consider months, if not years. Because it takes that long for that relationship and that trust to be built. But once that's built... You can share life and break bread together. Number two, answer their questions, not yours. What do I mean our questions? What are the key issues we have in America today? I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to let you think about it. You'll find for many Buddhists, that's not their key questions. Many of their key questions is things about what about my family? Their questions 
many times will be about my ancestors. Another thing that a lot of Buddhists deals with is why is Jesus the only way? They don't have problems that there's a God. If you say, are you atheists? They're not atheists in that sense. Their problem is, why is there only one God? Number three, be real. Do not put a false face. You and I, in this world, are going to go through hardships. But what is the selling factor is that we have someone who's going to walk alongside us during those times. And what happens at the end of that journey, they see someone that's real. They see someone that has shown there's a reality in our lives that they don't have. Be real. Number four, learn and listen. Learn. You will learn more from your Buddhist friends than you'll ever believe. Many of them will tell you about things of family that will be shocking. Learn how to cook with them. Nothing like a great Thai curry. But when they see that we're learning from them and we take an attitude of servanthood and humility, it makes a world of difference. Because so many in their past has been condescending. Having humility and learning. Next, I will say this. Point to Jesus. You know, Buddha is all about his teachings, not about him. For us, it's about a savior who died and raised to life. Point to Jesus. Jesus is what makes Christianity great. Not you and me, not any argument. Jesus. Point to Jesus. Let them fall in love with Jesus. Another one, I've used this a lot when we were living overseas. Love covers a multitude of sins. When you make mistakes, and let me give you a hint, you will. When you accidentally said something wrong, <laughs> when you made a cultural faux pas, I'll tell you right now, they, when they will know if you genuinely care and love them. That will cover a multitude of sins. There's two more I didn't put on here, but I want to highlight for you tonight. Number one, pray. Pray, pray, pray. When you finish praying, pray some more. Pray for them. Be in with them. Many of the Buddhist friends don't mind you praying with them. Pray for their families. Ask them a prayer request. Can I pray for you? What are some of the things that you, you are concerned about? I'll pray with you. You'll be surprised on how that transforms the relationship. And the, number, and the last one I wanted to highlight, be open for the Lord to break in with miracles. In most of the Buddhist world, they believe in demons, they believe in spirits. When Christ transformed that with miracles, and there's a power encounter, I'll, I'll tell you, Christ wins. Yes. Be open. Pray for healing. And anticipate the Lord can heal. We have covered quite a few, and we have a few minutes now for some question and answers. I want to invite both uh, Randy Jumper and my wife, Evelyn Lewis, to come up. I'm going to answer a few questions. And just, and just so you know, my wife actually uh, grew up from a Buddhist family. And so I want her to kind of come. Oh, wow. Three chairs. Why don't you take a drink of that water? Because you've been talking nonstop. So you feel that. Wasn't that incredible? So I got it before I get the first question. So tell Evelyn, tell us a little bit about your background. How did how did you and your family come to faith in Jesus? What's your background? Where are you from in the world? So I was born and raised in Indonesia. A Muslim country, but my family was Buddhist, so it was interesting. 
um, we um, didn't have hope uh, because, you know, as you can tell from the lesson that you learned today, I felt like as a child we were going around and around and around and around and never go anywhere. So there is no hope. And then we used to go to the temple to look at this um, uh, uh, pictures. In my mind, I still see it really clearly. People being um, uh, uh, hurt, being, uh, what do you call tortured. it? Uh, tortured uh, because they didn't do well in their previous life. And I got really scared. I would go home and hide in my, under my bed. So um, I just felt scared all the time, every time we went to you know, any kind of gathering because we were always told that if you don't do well now, you're going to be hurt, you know, you're going to come back as a donkey or, you know, or something. And it was, it was scary for us. So um, my parents couldn't have, didn't have answer to my questions. And um, because of a lot of missionaries have started schools, I was sent to a school that was a Christian school. So my father was also uh, influenced by education because a lot of missionaries started to uh, approach us by, n they know that we value education. So they make schools really good. All good schools in Indonesia were Christian schools. So um, I learned, my father did the same thing by going to schools. And then we will learn about life, about love and about uh, hope in Jesus. So there was another incident that happened when I was in my uh, when I was in seventh grade that I got into a car accident and I almost died, and I was so scared I was gonna go to hell because I was you know I, I saw the pictures in my head that I was gonna be punished and tortured, and I cry out and I remember my teacher in school that said that Jesus is a good friend. So I said, okay, this is my only chance, so I'm going to call on Jesus. So when I call on Jesus, he came through and performed miracles physically in my body that I was healed instantly. So that was the beginning of my journey with God. But, of course, it was a lot of uh, pitfalls in, in my belief because, you know, I, I was trained in different ways. So... I would say discipleship was a big thing. I was also discipled by a missionary. So I, I say that missions do work. And what's sad for me is that my generation, well, my previous generation, my parents' generation, only maybe, uh, I would say, 5% were, were, were rich. But my generation... When I became Christian, we start sharing. My brother became Christian. A lot of us became Christian. So 50% of my uh, generation in my family now are now Christians. Now, that sounds good, but my heart is really pain, in pain right now because my aunt just died, and, his, and her children still are not believers. So I pray every day. 50% is still a lot. There's still a lot of people in my family who don't know Jesus and who don't understand the love of God. So keep praying, and I keep writing them, you know, uh, uh, Facebook them, and whatever I could do, you know, to share. But it's really hard unless you really are there with them when they're in pain. Pastor Brian, we're going to take questions, and I just realized we probably need to grab a microphone. If you could help me with that while, while you're getting that ready. Uh, Pastor Rod, would you like to ask a question? Well, can you remind me what that one was? <laughs> okay, we're, we're all watching every day for the last several weeks, oh, yeah. the boys in the cave. Mm -hmm. right. From the Buddhist perspective, mm -hmm. what, how are they viewing that incident? Number two, how can we use that incident and that story to reach out to Buddhists? Because I assume they're all also seeing that same story. I would say that they probably ask, what did they do wrong? Yeah. What, what, what did they do wrong that cost them this? So it was always a karma again. And uh, so I'm going to... Yeah, yeah that, that would be the first part. Is the uh, automatic assumption is that it's bad karma. Uh, they, there is, we, we would... i got to be careful how I say this. Uh, it's, it, it's like something they did or their parents did. Um, I think part of it is with the conversation of saying, you know what? Some things happen, but we serve a gracious God. 
And it's part of that conversation. But to get to that point, it, your conversation, it can't start with that. <laughs> it has to be further. You have that relationship built. But to still say, maybe even starting this as the question and answer, how do you see this? Um, what's this mean to you? That opens that understanding in that relationship that uh, moves toward the kind of things we've been talking about. And the concept of you are actually forgiven mm. is a big thing because in the Buddhist, you know, there's no such a thing as somebody actually will forgive you. It's just like, it's gonna, you're gonna reap what you sow all the time. So, so the concept of forgiveness, in this case, you know, we can, uh, we can share with them. It's like, they, even if they did something wrong and they got into there, there's always a way out. There's always, you know, some, somebody outside can come and rescue them. So we pray that they will be rescued because a lot of the missionaries in Thailand right now are, you know, are telling that story. Like, you can be redeemed. So if you have a question, uh, if you'll stand up, Pastor Brian will come to you and he'll hold the mic. And here's, here's my request because we've only got our guests for a short amount of time. Uh, just ask your question as quick and concise as you can and um, we'll do our best to answer. So on that note of forgiveness, how does that play out in families, like between parents and children, if a child, a child does something wrong or something? That is another story for me. <laughs> but um, I just had my mom last month and I had this conversation with her and, and it's really hard when it, it's your own family when they keep telling you, they remind you of what you did wrong that, because that's their job. So that they remind you to, that you did something wrong so that you can um, do the other side of it. You can do something good. So they request that you would do something good by telling you that you did something wrong. Does it make, make sense? So um, there is a lot of dynamic because of that. So I sat with my, my mother and then God spoke to me that she's been treated that way and she doesn't understand any better. She's, I mean, she's become Christian, but she still has, I'm a little bit further along in terms of my faith, so I need to forgive her. I need to forgive her that she's done this and she's gonna keep doing it because that's all she knows how. So we pray for, for forgiveness for each other, but also I have to watch that what I've been treated as will not continue to my, my, my children. You know, the way that we, we treat our children is how we are treated. So there's a lot of prayers, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, uh, growth and a lot of fasting as well. So it's continuous continuation. Let me add one thing real quick. And that is, for many of the Buddhists, they're not from a guilt culture. They're from a shame culture. So forgiveness is a public issue. So, um, so being aware that um, it's not just uh, I did something wrong and I was forgiven. It's that I've done something wrong causing loss of face to my family, causing loss of face to God or whatever and so forth their forgiveness then has a shame dynamic and for most of us from America we don't grow up with that but for many of them that's where they are and that's why the forgiveness is tied directly to shame I'd like to know about how Buddhists view other world religions do they have, not just Christianity but Muslims they came out of his Hinduism, how do they view those things? And do they think they're being evangelistic, so to speak? Are they trying to reach other religions? Um, basically, most Buddhists, now granted, you'll have, I'm gonna use a term here that's now a technical term, they call it fundamentalist Buddhists. Uh, I'm not including them. But for most Buddhists, they see them as m multiple equal ways to heaven, nirvana, or whatever. So that's why, remember the question I said, Jesus is the only way, is one of the questions they have. Because one of their things is, oh, well, you know, just be faithful in whatever way you're going. Be a good Hindu. Be a good Muslim, you know, as long as you don't hurt anybody. Uh, that's kind of a worldview they have. 
Uh, why? Because you're being reincarnated. If you're wrong this life, get it right the next one. Uh, so that kind of worldview allows for this kind of uh, openness to whatever religions. Now, there is a subset now becoming more and more fundamentalist, and they're the ones you'll hear about attacking certain groups or whatever, but that's still a, a small, small minority in the Buddhist world. I think Kevin's got his hand up, doesn't he? I've got a colleague who would probably be claim as a Buddhist. Um, so what, what variation of Buddhism has, has taken root? Well, actually, you'll find all branches here now. Um, you go out to California, they have some of the largest Buddhist temples. But the ones that are, shall I say, scratching the American itch the most is more of the Mahayana. It's, it's um, because you can kind of add things into your religion <laughs> And it's almost, it, it actually is very similar to New Age. If you're familiar with the New Age philosophies and so forth. And, and some of them have become an amalgamation of Buddhism and Hinduism and a whole host of things. And most of them fit really in that kind of a category. So that would be the, probably the largest single group. There's a lot like Richard Gere, for instance, that's in Tibetan Buddhism. But the way he practices it, most Tibetan Buddhists wouldn't recognize. So... It's kind of a modified version. I think we got time for, or go ahead. I was just going to say one thing that is very important when we try to uh, evangelize, when we try to bring the good news to the, the Buddhists, is that we need to provide a new family for them. Yeah. Because uh, it's, it's really a family structure. And if you, if, when I became a Christian, if the church was not there for me, to disciple, to take me in as, as, you know, as, as one of family members, I probably would not have survived. Because family is such a big thing. Marianne, last question. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, you know, I understand the hopelessness uh, that you were talking about, but I'm a little bit confused. On the karma issue, you have the good karma and the bad karma. If you have good karma, then you're eventually going to reach nirvana or keep progressing upward is what I understood. So if you have the bad karma and you are punished by reincarnated into a lesser form, do you have to work through forms or come back to humanity and then work out of that to get good karma? And I mean, it, it seems like it would be a never-ending process to me. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, you got it right. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And if you are not doing good, you may become as a mosquito the next life. You know, and, and the whole idea is, okay, um, I, didn't, I was not a good mosquito, and so I come back as a slug or whatever. Yeah, oh, I but then the equal is the other way. I'll never forget a friend of mine who was practicing Buddhism. See, I was, I was not really practicing Buddhist. I was just born into a Buddhist family. But my friend, one of my friends, when, you know, we had a lot of mosquitoes in Jakarta. And I hated them. I would kill them. And my friend said, Evelyn, you cannot kill mosquitoes. And I look at her as like, what? So she, she told me this. And it's like, oh my goodness. That's when I said, this is a never ending. There is no hope. There is no hope. That's the way it's like. It's really hopeless. So I always say that bring hope to the people without hope. And, and let me just add one more thing because it hadn't been mentioned tonight. Many Buddhists really fear death as well. Because in death, you may end up going downward. So the fear of death is very, very prominent for many Buddhists. So just keep that in mind uh, as you're talking to many of them. Mm -hmm.